All right, so it's uh, 6.02. I'm Greg Branch. We'll call the meeting uh, to order. And I'll ask uh, Director Fox to uh, lead us in the pledge. My pleasure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and uh, we will call the board members. We've got uh, uh, Director Swartz, Director Fox uh, here along with myself, and uh, Director Wisniewski uh, joining via phone. Uh, if you guys would take a look at the, at the packet there real quick, and tell me if you see any additions or deletions for, uh, for the agenda. Okay, Did you have a chance to look at that, Len? Yes, everything's fine. Okay. I don't have any. All right, cool. You're good? I am good. Okay, yes. all Thank right. You. So let's take a look at the uh, February uh, regular minutes then and uh, see, see if we can. Uh... Yes. You need a motion to approve. The oh, sorry. So we need a motion to approve the So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Thank you, Len. I know we got Aye. a slight delay there. <laughs> I'm fast. Okay, so now we can take a look at the uh, February uh, minutes. Uh, I will recuse myself since I wasn't there. Okay. Uh, any comments, Len? No, it's fine. Thank you, Chris. Okay. So, can someone uh, make a motion? Uh, motion to approve the minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I will abstain. Okay. Very good. All right. So, with that, uh, I'll turn it to Alec for uh, the financial uh, review. Uh, you have in your materials a lot of uh, items, especially dealing with the. Uh, Results as of December 31st, 2012. Keep in mind these are unaudited figures. Uh, in addition to these materials, the chief has uh, made extensive comments about our finances in the annual report, which is also before you, which uh, you know really reflects pretty much what these uh, uh, statements that you've got in your packet. Um, so I'm not going to go through that because the chief has talked about uh, 2012 issues and I think very well in his, uh, his report. So I'm going to simply move, we do have our uh, January and February uh, expenses for this year that we did not approve at the last meeting because they were not available. So you have uh, part of the uh, last pages. There's some detail about these amounts, but at the moment, I'm going to ask for a motion approving uh, $86,904 for expenses for January and uh, $145,857 for February. And that's a motion. And I'll second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, with regard to the audit, I mentioned last year we do have that underway. It's all scheduled. We can sign the letter of agreement with the auditor, um, noting it then that the amounts that the uh, of the audit that are attributable to the pension plan will be paid for by the pension fund instead of by the district district will be reimbursed for that. Uh, we've had extensive discussions with the auditor, with our accountant, and uh, uh, there's been a lot of work going into preparing the materials to the auditor. I think they're done. Is that right? The materials to the auditor all right now. So unless there are any questions, that's my report.
Len, are you good? No questions. Okay. All right. So with that, I'll turn to uh, Chief. Okay. Uh, as um, Alec mentioned, uh, the annual report, uh, which is available if anybody would like a copy over there, uh, is um, does cover uh, uh, 2012 uh, and uh, covers both uh, the operations uh, side of the uh, district as well as our uh, you know financial uh, situation for you know, uh, based on the the uh, numbers that the accountant just uh, completed in the last couple of days. Um, I think that a lot of the material in here is. Uh, material or issues that we've discussed uh, during the year. Um, so uh, hopefully there aren't any uh, significant surprises, but uh, I'll just go over, um, over the information in here uh, briefly. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 1,117 calls last year. Uh, and of those, what we did see is that um, we actually saw a decrease in uh, EMS calls, uh, surprisingly and a relatively low number of fire calls, but a very dramatic increase in uh, the number of false alarms and smoke reports. Uh, mm -hmm. And a lot of that can be traced uh, right back to you know, the May, June period when we were getting a lot of calls from smoke from the Waldo Canyon, uh, smoke coming in from other parts of the country. And, uh, and in fact, I think that um, we probably only recorded about a third of the calls that we were actually getting on some of the busier nights. Um, I know that uh, at uh, one point um, we had over a hundred calls into the station alone uh, for smoke reports. Uh, normally um, in the past we would have uh, you know basically just told, told people in, in most of those cases that uh, you know uh, you know if we knew that smoke was coming in from outside the area that uh, that would be sufficient for um, you know, rather than going out and investigating each actual address. However, since the uh, Lower North Fork fire, uh, Jefferson County adopted a policy that we, that either us or the sheriff will go to every location that's reported, whether we think there's something there or not. So it ended up being um, a lot of additional hours of response uh, for the personnel. Um, what we've noticed with the uh, uh, calls again, um, you know, we did see that uh, ambulance calls dropped off and, uh, and transports dropped off uh, pretty significantly. We were almost off about 20% on uh, ambulance transports from previous years and uh, a lot of that can be attributed to uh, persons uh, choosing to um, seek medical assistance on their own rather than uh, you know, take a transport which they would get then get billed for. So that would be primarily the folks that either uh, don't have insurance or, you know, don't want to pay the deductible on their insurance uh, to uh, accept an ambulance ride. We try to uh, discourage that whenever it's uh, medically, um, you know, uh, risky for them to respond, you know, go down to the hospital on their own. But in the end, uh, they do have, you know, for the most part, they have their, the right to decide whether they're going to take a ride in the ambulance or not. Um, this, uh, this trend, by the way, is something that we've seen or we have heard from many of the other uh, agencies. It's, it's pretty much across the board that that's, that's been a trend that's been happening. Um, you know, more and more people are, are opting not to uh, seek medical assistance because of the, uh, the cost. Uh, one of the other things that we did uh, notice in looking at our calls um, is that, uh, you know, very, uh, very few of our calls occur during the nighttime, um, and in fact, uh, you can see that they really peak, uh, you know, midday, um, which unfortunately is the time that we have the least number of volunteers available to respond. So uh, that is also a trend that we see, you know, basically occurring across uh, most of the country, in that you know, call volumes increase during the daytime, volunteers are le are least available during the daytime. Uh, we have been fortunate um, that uh, many of the, the volunteers that we have now have been coming in, especially since the first of the year, and uh, uh, basically pulling shifts during the daytime alongside the, uh, the paid crew, and that has been helping dramatically in providing uh, sufficient staffing for, uh, for uh, those calls. 
Um, in terms of notable incidents, I think we're all aware of the, uh, you know, the Lower North Fork fire was the biggest uh, incident that we had to deal with last year. Um, and I think that we've all heard plenty about that uh, until now. Um, you know, during the uh, mid part of the year, uh, again, we were very busy providing assistance throughout the Rocky Mountain region because of the uh, excessive number of fires and the low number of resources that were available. Uh, we uh, assisted with uh, a total of uh, seven fires, um, you know, outside the region, and uh, we had um, been asked multiple times uh, if we could provide resources to additional incidents, but uh, had to turn those down just from, you know, a lack of adequate personnel to, to uh, um, get out on and, and help out. Um, just kind of a note on that, uh, we anticipate, um, you know, the, the current forecast for the 2013 fire season is um, for a busy one nationwide once again. And, uh, you know, with uh, sequestration going into effect, uh, uh, we just got word that the Forest Service is going to be cutting 500 firefighters and 50 engines across the country. Uh, and they are, are still down aircraft as well and have not replaced those aircraft. So, uh, you know, the federal agencies are going to be going into the fire season uh, severely shorthanded uh, this year. So we anticipate that there will continue to be a request for assistance from, from many of the local fire departments across the country as well. Uh, the other, we had a relatively quiet year for structure fires. Um, the, the few that we did have uh, all uh, occurred in the uh, uh, latter end of the, of the um, uh, year. Uh, and um, two of them uh, accounted for most of the fire loss that we had. We had uh, uh, one home down on Ute Road uh, that was destroyed by a, a chimney fire that spread to the house, and then an electrical fire in a house out on Smith Road uh, caused an estimated 375,000 in damages. Uh, it, other than those two fires, the total loss that we had for the year was about $2,000, so relatively low. Um, but that's the way structure fires go. They, you know. You, you won't have one for three months, and then you'll have three in a week, uh, which is essentially what happened. Okay, um, our average response time for calls last year was two minute, or 12 minutes and 25 seconds, uh, and uh, it was quite a bit longer for fire calls than it was for uh, EMS calls, in part because uh, you know our personnel, when they're responding to fire calls, have to go into the ambulance bay, get dressed and then go out to the, uh, the other building and uh, take the engine from there. So it's a slower process, unfortunately. Um, and then we also uh, had, uh, you know, unfortunately, those, uh, a few of those structure fires were in the very far out, uh, reaches of the district, which also um, added to that average longer uh, response. Uh, there is an analysis in here of our um, of our response times compared with the uh, national standards uh, that are recommended uh, for response. And you can see that, uh, you know, in urban and, and suburban areas, uh, the response, uh, you know, recommended response is six minutes and 10 minutes. We don't have any areas within our district that fall into those categories. We do have rural and remote. Uh, remote areas are those areas that are uh, more than eight miles distant from a fire station, and uh, for the most part, that be, would be places, uh, you know, on some of the dirt roads like uh, Lost Resort Creek Road or uh, you know White Hawk Trail or places like that where we have relatively little population as well. Um, and there's no time specification for for that in the rural areas, which essentially makes up all of uh, you know, our district. Uh, the recommended response time is uh, to get to 80% of all calls in 12 minutes or less. And we actually, um, we're at 51% on that. So that's a, that's a target that uh, we're going to work toward increasing that uh, response capability. However, uh, you know, we know that going into it, we have, you know, with only two person, staffing at the station here, 
uh, and uh, this being the only one of the four stations that is staffed, uh, you know, we're going to have delays in, in a large part of the district as we wait for volunteers to respond uh, you know, from their homes. Uh, another factor that uh, really uh, hits us is those calls where we have more than one incident occurring at the same time. Uh, every time that we go out on an EMS call with a transport, uh, the average round trip uh, down to the hospital and back is 90 minutes. If you know, we only have two persons on, uh, on staff at any uh, given time, if they're out on a transport for that 90 minute period, we get another call in, then we're relying on volunteers to come in and respond. Uh, there were a couple of times where we got to three and four calls at a time, and in those cases, uh, we were actually having to call in uh, assistance from neighboring departments. And a few of those calls ended up being response times in the neighborhood of 45 to 60 minutes, which is really outside of uh, what I would see as an acceptable response time to an incident. Uh, as you know, we've been working with, uh, with all of the departments and with dispatch to set up a program where dispatch will send the next closest resource automatically if we don't have a resource available to respond. However, we think we're still three or four months away from uh, them being able to do that. So in the meantime, we still have to, you know, um, basically get on the radio and ask them to begin calling around to other fire departments to see if anybody has a resource, you know, an ambulance or a fire engine that they can uh, send when we're uh, busy. Um, Another, fat, you know, another measure that we look at with the uh, uh, response times is how long does it take us to assemble, uh, you know, a minimum uh, force for fighting a fire at structure fires, and uh, that standard is uh, in rural areas is that six firefighters on scene in 14 minutes, 80 percent of the time. Uh, we only met that standard 30 percent of the time, and again. With a staffing of two out of the station, that's generally what's going to be responding on, on that first uh, unit. So the additional personnel are going to be personnel that are going to be responding from home, which typically means a six to eight minute delay uh, before that, uh, that uh, unit is able to, to get out. Okay, uh, moving on, uh, looking at the demographics of the district. Uh, uh, I did uh, do a little bit of research into what our demographic situation is in our district, and there were a couple of things that um, were notable in that. Uh, first off, that um, the estimates of population in our district have uh, declined over the last several years by approximately 5%, which is a fairly significant uh, de decline in population. Uh, I believe that probably goes along with uh, closing of, of a number of businesses in the last two years up in the area um, uh, and uh, vacancies in the business uh, 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 commercial centers. And along with that, we saw that uh, there was actually an increase in the number of people uh, in, within the district that are on Social Security and Medicare. Uh, so basically, the, the average age of the resident of our district uh, has gone up from what was estimated uh, two years ago at 40 years of age to 47 years of age. So it's been a combination both of people leaving and of an actual increase among the people that are still here uh, in, the, in the, uh, the elderly population. Um, and we, we're seeing that in, in terms of our ambulance billing as well as more and more of our ambulance transports, our Medicare transports, and, and fewer of them are private uh, insurance transports. Um, we did see within the year, um, you know, it looks like the real estate market is uh, is turning around, at least according to Zillow, which is probably uh, somewhat reliable in terms of uh, uh, reporting uh, real estate values. Uh, however, um, you know, they are also a little bit. Uh, prone to, uh, you know, because it's an automated program, it reacts a little bit, it overreacts to sales that may occur in the, in the real estate market. Uh, but we can, we can certainly, it's looking like, um, you know, the, the housing market has passed uh, the, um, the low point and has started to recover. 
Uh, we certainly have been hearing that in the, in the greater Denver metro area, uh, but we do know that we are lagging behind that, uh, the Denver metro area. They've already surpassed uh, you know, the average uh, home prices uh, from the peak uh, prior to the, um, the market uh, um, crash in 2008. Uh, one, uh, di one problem with that for the fire district is that uh, we run two years behind uh, housing values in terms of uh, property tax collections. So uh, if the market turns around in, in 2013, uh, we won't see an increase in uh, property tax revenue for the fire district until 2015. So uh, for the next two years, we're basically going to continue to see uh, those slight losses that, uh, that we had in you know, uh, 2011 and, uh, and 2010 and 2011. Uh, so we can anticipate that we will continue to see decrease in property taxes over the next two years, or at best, those property taxes will flatten out. Okay, um, the next part of the, of the report does cover valuation and, and property tax revenue. And again, uh, you know, the property assessed value has uh, fallen uh, uh, five or five percent uh, since the 2008 um, uh, peak, and uh, right now uh, we're down to an assessed valuation of, of 199 million in the district. Uh, our mill rate is uh, 4.91, which is the lowest uh, in you know the uh, Denver metro area, and one of the uh, one of the very lowest in the state of Colorado. So, unfortunately, that does mean that um, you know our, our tax funding is uh, is very challenged. Um, you can see that uh, you know right now um, in Jefferson County, uh, you know 5.8 percent of property taxes in areas that don't have uh, overlay districts uh, goes to uh, the fire district, whereas approximately. Uh, 70% goes to the school district and another um, uh, about 28% to the um, uh, county fund. Um, in some of the areas, uh, there are additional uh, fees such as uh, in um, Kings Valley has a water district and Willow West has a uh, metropolitan service district. So in those areas, those are also uh, added into that total uh, tax bill for those um, areas. Um, so we began uh, 2012 with a cash balance of uh, $541,000. Uh, we collected more revenues uh, during the year than we had anticipated. However, uh, the, those additional revenues were pretty much entirely from the wildfire reimbursements from assisting in other areas, which was $236,000. Uh, taking that out of the picture, we actually were well below our projected revenues. Um, and what we saw is that we actually had, uh, uh, and we just got the final numbers on the property taxes, is that we actually ended up about um, uh, $19,000 below projection on the property tax. And what that indicates is that there were a percentage of people who basically just didn't pay their property taxes. Uh, those are very often distressed properties. The fire districts will get that fund at some point, you know, usually when a distressed property goes to a foreclosure sale or in you know, some cases when uh, you know, eventually that land is transferred or sold. Or, um, you know, so we'll often get the back taxes that are owed, but uh, you know, in times when uh, uh, people are short, we tend to see the, those numbers drop down below the projected uh, number, and that was the case here. Uh, we did collect more in ownership taxes, which are the license plate fees uh, that we had expected. Uh, but another big area where we did see uh, an uh, unforecast uh, decrease again was the ambulance revenues, where we were about $90,000 below projection there. Um, our net revenue for ambulance billing, again, is, uh, is off by uh, about a hundred thousand uh, dollars over the year too. So, we made that uh, up with the uh, the wildfire reimbursement funds, and essentially, essentially broke even for the year. 
uh, which is the first time in three years that we did, although I was hoping that we would actually have a little more cushion than we did. Uh, we basically collected about $2,000 more than we spent during the year, which is a very, I mean, it's essentially 100% uh, uh, on, uh, on spending. Uh, again, property tax revenues, you can see in there uh, the, the trend that uh, we have have had in the property tax, um, uh, uh, which has fallen from a high of a, about a 1.1 million to uh, this past year. Uh, you know, uh, we're down to about uh, 980,000 and we're anticipating uh, that uh, is going to fall a little bit further. We had budgeted almost 980,000 going into next year. However, if we once again have, um, you know, a shortfall where property taxes aren't paid, then we'll see, a, you know, an additional fall off in the in the projected um, in the projected uh, property tax funds. Okay. Um, in expenditures, uh, we also had expenditures that were higher than, uh, than originally budgeted, but the biggest uh, chunk of those essentially came in the uh, uh, wildfire suppression uh, fund. You know, and again, we collected two hundred thirty-six thousand uh, dollars, you know, in reimbursement on that. However, one hundred thirty-seven thousand dollars of that was money that we spent, essentially payroll and and costs, fuel costs, and then the other costs for going out there. So, you know, they, um, the remainder of that, which was uh, about $100,000, again, plugged a shortfall in the general budget for us. The, uh, the other areas that we went uh, uh, higher than projected included um, uh, fire suppression, uh, which included equipment, and, uh, as well as, uh, um, you know, a number of other uh, ex expenses. Uh, maintenance was higher than, um, than budgeted. And then uh, we also had uh, the refund of, of grant funds, which we approved uh, just recently, uh, paying back the overpaid uh, um, grant funds, which again left us uh, $2,333 uh, in excess of, of um, the expenditures. Uh, we had projected a carryover of $571,000, unfortunately, going into uh, 2013. Uh, we're actually at about 543,000, uh, so a little bit lower than I, again than I was hoping we would uh, we would be at, and a, and a big part of that again was that revenues uh, didn't match up to the original projections from uh, from the beginning of the year. Uh, that lead, again um, our reserves essentially that 543,000 is the the current uh, reserve fund for the district, and that is. Um, you know, restricted uh, the Tabor reserves are three percent of the of the revenue, uh, and that has to be uh, kept uh, for catastrophic emergencies by state law. Uh, and then um, the board restricted reserves of a hundred thousand that we're uh, retaining for non-catastrophic emergencies. Uh, you know, and then the uh, three hundred fifty-one thousand is uh, is set aside for. Uh, maintaining our cash flow at this time of the year, uh, because you know currently we've only taken in four percent of uh, tax revenues, but uh, obviously we've had two months of spending, so uh, we'll see, we see our reserves dip down to their lowest point uh, sometime in March, and then begin to begin to come back up around April. So that um, that uh, number there is based on estimates of how much we're going to be spending during the first three months of each year. That leaves, unfortunately, a total unrestricted reserve at this point of $44,000. Uh, and uh, that's the main reason that we have cut, uh, cut any capital funding or uh, any um, you know, significant purchases because that $44,000 uh, wouldn't even make uh, the first year's, uh, it wouldn't even make the down payment on an on a ambulance or a fire engine, unfortunately. Uh, moving on to training, uh, we had uh, ended the year with 64 volunteers and uh, a total of um, uh, eight uh, response uh, paid staff. 
Uh, with uh, what we saw with that is that um, the volunteers logged uh, 7,219 hours of training, which uh, works out to 112 hours each uh, volunteer during the year, uh, which is a pretty significant amount of, of effort on the parts of our volunteers, or about two hours every week for every single volunteer. Um, and then the paid staff uh, averaged about 14 hours a month uh, of training as well. The, uh, the department basically was continuing uh, most of our training programs through the year. Uh, we did add the uh, program for emergency medical responders during the year so that uh, we're taking volunteers that are not um, primarily firefighters and that was a, a successful recruiting move on our part as it brought in uh, quite a few firefighter or you know, EMTs and paramedics at the end of the year uh, to join the department. Um, there were a couple of other areas that we did look at uh, benchmarks uh, for training as well and um, one of those is to get all of our personnel to the firefighter 2 level. Uh, all of our new personnel are trained to that level however uh, we will have to work to bring our um, some of our grandfathered members up to that uh, as uh, that's now a requirement for us to be eligible for grant funding in the future. The other benchmark standard that we're looking at for training is the uh, ISO standard, which is the uh, basically the company or the outfit that sets the insurance uh, rates, fire insurance rates for the, the district, and they do a, an evaluation of all aspects of the of the uh, fire department, uh, you know, equipment, uh, fire hydrant locations, uh, and as well as training. However, training is one of the biggest factors in there, and it accounts for 20 percent of the total. Uh, rating that they provide to the fire department. So uh, trying to meet that standard will be uh, one of the big things that we're going to push for so that uh, we can uh, maintain uh, you know, a good uh, fire insurance rate uh, for the district. Uh, and to do that we're going to need to um, increase our, our training as, much, as close to 16 hours per member as possible. And then another big thing that we're going to be uh, looking at doing is um, working on uh, trying to do uh, pre-plans and uh, company uh, inspections of all of the commercial buildings. Uh, basically, they, they place a big, uh, uh, big emphasis on having uh, our personnel go to every commercial uh, occupancy in the district at least once a year uh, to determine what they would do in the event of a fire uh, in that location. So that's a program that uh, we have since the first of this year uh, started to have our firefighters work on and uh, we'll be implementing that over the next several months. Uh, staffing, as you're aware, um, we did uh, 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 lose uh, uh, Chief Page at the end of the year uh, and we also um, eliminated the half-time administrative position. Uh, we, all, we had two uh, turnover of two of our uh, firefighter paramedics during the year and then we had the promotion of the uh, three um, firefighter EMTs to lieutenant or captain. Had uh, seven volunteers uh, left the department. Um, most of those were removed for inactivity. I think we had one who moved out of the area uh, and then uh, 11 uh, new volunteers that joined and then six other members who joined us uh, during the, the emergency medical provider program. Um, prevention, uh, again, the big focus that we had in prevention was the mitigation uh, programs and working to uh, encourage the FireWise uh, and we, programs. And we have had uh, additional um, interest uh, as we get into the spring. Uh, a lot of the people who put that on the back burner for the fall are now uh, calling up and we're doing a lot more uh, home inspections, providing mitigation advice, and working with neighborhoods on the, uh, getting the FireWise uh, program implemented in those, uh, in those communities. The other side of prevention, however, you know, we, uh, for a while back in, uh, you know, kind of the boom days back in 2005 to 2007, the fire marshal's position was funded almost entirely from 
permit fees for new construction. Uh, at the peak, uh, that was uh, you know running about fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year. Um, that has fallen by eighty percent to the lowest level since the fire marshal's position was placed in in the department, uh, with a total of um, about eight thousand dollars in permit or ninety nine thousand dollars in permit fees for the year. So. Uh, basically, 80 for 80 percent fall off in the in the workload from the fire marshal's position, uh, which led, of course, to part of our decision to uh, uh, eliminate that uh, that position in the department. Okay, then finally, in the apparatus, um, you know, we did add one used brush truck during the year, uh, and uh, that is uh, um, our uh, fleet. Uh, uh, supervisor has been working to uh, get that into service before uh, fire season gets going this year. Uh, we had a replacement ambulance uh, during the year, and then we removed uh, the hazmat truck, the pump truck, and uh, the reserve ambulance, as well as one of the staff vehicles. Uh, basically, cut those uh, those vehicles out of the uh, out of the fleet. And then on the last page there, you can see the um, basically our situation as far as our rolling stock goes. Um, we, you can see that uh, any of the uh, boxes that are marked red in that um, chart are those apparatus that have met or exceeded their expected service life. And expected service life doesn't mean that uh, you know, those trucks are no longer suitable, uh, but it is uh, useful for us in terms of a planning tool to determine, you know, on average when we want to be replacing those apparatus. Uh, the longer that you go beyond the service life, the higher the maintenance costs go, the less effective the, uh, the apparatus is, and uh, unfortunately every year that you put off purchasing an apparatus, uh, the cost goes up uh, faster than the, um, you know, basically the uh, annual cost of owning it. So in other words, if you figure that a fire engine lasts 20 years, you know, every year the cost of a new fire engine goes up by more than 5% a year, unfortunately. Uh, they, they increase uh, pretty, uh, pretty continuously. Uh, so you can see that we are definitely behind where we need to be in terms of setting aside funds uh, to replace those apparatus. Again, we have $44,000 in, uh, in um, unrestricted reserves, and uh, right now, if we were to uh, look at the, the cost of replacing all of the stuff that is at its uh, expected service life, we're already at uh, $1.3 million. Um, you know, some of those apparatus are in good shape. Others, uh, uh, we have several of them that, uh, that don't pass their pump test, and uh, as of such are not really considered operational uh, according to you know ISO standards um, you know we really should work toward uh, you know how we're going to uh, be replacing those the biggest uh, the biggest threat that we have with that is the older tenders and that is you know if uh, we were to take those tenders out of service uh, for the district then 90% um, of the district would lose that class 5 rating and go to an unprotected uh, classification. Essentially, the cost of fire insurance for basically everybody in the district would triple if we can't keep our uh, water supply credit from having those tenders. And that that is you know one thing that we are going to have to address as we move ahead here is how do we replace those you know two of those tenders again are you know coming back from uh, 1988. Uh, and uh, you know are, are really beyond their expected service life this time. Um, annualizing the cost, you know, of our entire fleet over, uh, you know, over its service life, essentially is uh, you know two hundred ninety-eight thousand dollars should be set aside for ambulance or for apparatus uh, replacement, you know, given our current fleet size in order to maintain that fleet. And unfortunately, over the last several years, we have just, we have basically put the funding into the, um, the one ambulance and the used brush truck, 
and the rest of the fleet, uh, we have not been setting aside money for. Uh, do you have any questions on that on that report? I think it's an excellent job. Wow, thank you. And uh, I, I have a few questions that I'll go over separately. Uh, okay. Some items in here, but uh, generally speaking, I think it's a, it's a good way to portray the entire department, and our district, and where we stand, and where we need to go in the future. Okay. Very good. Since I've been on the board, uh, I've never seen such a comprehensive report. I thank you, Chief, and take me a little while to digest it. And perhaps I'll have some questions for you next month. Thank okay. you. Likewise. Um, Chief, there's a, there's one question that I have, and, and it's sure. likely that there is no real good answer to this. Is there any um, uh, comparison between the outcomes of uh, citizens who are transported via ambulance versus self-transport? That, that's really very hard for us to track because yeah. if they self-transport, uh, all of the people that we transport, we have very good data on what happens to them. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, uh, you know, with, uh, particularly since we've moved to Swedish Hospital, they look at every single call that we go on very carefully and provide us a lot of feedback about it. Yeah. Uh, people who transport themselves may go to a variety of different facilities, uh, and we don't have access to you know, what happens in those situations. It'd be interesting to know that, but there's no way that, it, it, that and the department can assemble yeah, those kinds of statistics. We, we really can't. Uh, uh, you know, we know that um, you know across the country it's becoming a, a bigger issue, mm -hmm. and it is. Uh, you know, it, it ties together with the problems that many of the medical facilities are having where, you know, people that are otherwise uh, not seeking medical assistance are, you know, basically their sole medical contact is either the emergency room or in some cases the personnel on the ambulance. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some of those cases they'll call an ambulance just to get, you know, treatment at home and they won't even drive themselves to the hospital because right. If we go and provide them assistance, uh, don't transport them. There's no charge for that at all. Uh, however, we're not really geared up for that. We don't run doctors and nurses on the ambulance. Our our uh, ability is based on be, you know being able to intervene uh, and uh, deal with emergency situations, not to provide you know uh, healthcare to you know many of those people. There's no way that, uh, has, have any departments or any ambulance services started or been successful in charging for emergency intervention without transport? There are, however, we'd have to look at, uh, you know, how, how that could be done. Um, and generally, you know, we try as much as possible to not charge for our services so that we don't discourage people from calling when they need us. Um, you know, ambulance transports is, is basically the only area where we uh, charge for service currently. Uh, and, um, you know, we could certainly look at that, but, uh, you know, I certainly have mixed feelings about that. I, you know, for example, many areas that, you know, rely on uh, tax funding for that service will provide ambulance transport to residents of the fire district at no cost mm -hmm. or at only the cost of um, you know the ambulance or what the insurance company will cover uh, and that actually is a, is a nice program because it means that you know none of our residents would be out of pocket on, on those ambulance transports. Um, we deal with a lot of financial aid applications from folks who are on, you know, uh, disability or on other, you know, very limited incomes, uh, and it's very difficult for us to, you know, I mean, if someone is making, you know, nine hundred dollars a month on, you know, social security disability payments, it's pretty hard for us to say we want you to pay two thousand dollars for, you know, an ambulance uh, ride. Uh, so we generally will, you know, waive the, waive the cost on those. Uh, we're not in a situation, obviously, where we can 
provide this service without uh, billing for it, but we're trying to strike a balance between, you know, providing the service and, you know, still keeping our financial uh, load afloat. But, but, but absent some kind of other support uh, from the public, we the problem, are, are, the are not going to be able to, to, to continue this kind of service. That, that's true, but the biggest problem with that is that um, people's insurance and Medicare do not pay for a visit by an ambulance. They pay only for a transport. So if we charge anybody for visiting their home, providing care, and not transporting them, then that is always out of their pocket. Okay. Right. Uh, on another subject, uh, you're still recruiting for the uh, assistant chief position, is that correct? Right, we are, um, and uh, we're hopefully going to be inviting uh, personnel to interviews shortly. Uh, we have been working on um, basically narrowing the list down uh, from the 18 applicants that we have. Um, and uh, my hope is that we'll be conducting inter you know, phone interviews in the next couple of weeks. Uh, a couple of other um, current issues that I'll bring you up to speed on. Uh, the MAP uh, project, uh, we have gotten all of the uh, um, maps are uh, data has been uh, entered, uh, the maps are in proof form and we anticipate uh, getting those actually uh, printed up and, and onto all the apparatus within the next couple of weeks. And the UTB that was funded by the grant from the Rotary Foundation it has uh, arrived and we've got that uh, uh, waiting for basically to get a water tank and pump on the back and then have it ready to go for, uh, for wildfire season. Any other questions? I have not <clears throat> else. Excuse me. No. Len, you good? Good. Thank you. All right. So, Marie, remind me with the uh, Chief's report, is there anything else we need to do with that? All right. Thank you. Just want to make sure. Okay. So, with that, uh, any old business items? I have a question. Um, Sharon Trilk. Okay, hi Sharon. Hi there. Um, so I asked the chief a while ago, and I know he's very busy, and I don't know if he's had a chance to ask all of you this, but I was inquiring about whether you could set up a PayPal account that people could donate directly to the fire department without having to send a check in. You could put the button on your website, I could put the button on my website, and it would make it easier for people to donate to you because, as you say, you are struggling right now, especially with tax season being at this time of year. And it would be a great way that we would love to help out for sure. I like that. I just used it today for exactly what you're talking about. I think it's a great idea. Okay. We, we need to explore that. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for raising idea. that, yes. And then you can put it on 285 bound at the fire department. It will be on the home page. <laughs> there you go. We'll, we'll be back to you shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Any other items? Okay. With that, I would take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 At uh, 18. 1849. All right, thank you.